in this province and eight nearby American states. What might a new U.S. administration mean on our shores and theirs? Well, ahead of tonight's episode of Political Blind Date on TVO, exploring critical cross-border water issues, we're looking into that. First up, Nam Kiwanuka talks to former Liberal MP Selena Caesar Chavan about her powerful new memoir on why she parted ways with politics, her party, and the Prime Minister. It's Tuesday, February 2nd, and that's ahead on the agenda. In 2015, Justin Trudeau's Liberal Party won a majority government with a promise of sunny ways. The rookie Liberal MP for Whitby, Selena Caesar Chavan, was among those smiling and looking to a bright new era. But not even four years later, she announced that she would not seek another term and left the party to sit as an independent. What happened? Selena Caesar Chavan explains in her book, it's called, Can You Hear Me Now? How I Found My Voice and Learned to Live with Passion and Purpose. And she joins us now from Whitby. Hi, Selena. Hi, Nam. Oh my goodness, it's so great to be on with you. It's so nice to have you back on the show. We've got lots to get into, so let's get into it. Um, so you start okay. in the book talking about your childhood. You're from Grenada. You immigrated to Canada in the late 1970s when you were just two, and soon after arriving, you say you learned, and I quote, a Caribbean family's unwritten rules were very different from the rules from the other families around us. What were those rules? Oh my goodness. Well, where do I start? <laughs> um, we, we didn't really eat out. Uh, family was really close, but there was also, uh, you know, the, the corporal punishment side, which I talk about in the book. And, uh, it was something that I think it didn't define us as a family, but knowing that my my parents came from Grenada to here to make a better life, they wanted to instill that discipline that was required to, I guess, live in the big country of Canada. And so they kept their family really close, but uh, ruled with a heavy hand. And in the book, you talk about your love of swearing. <laughs> and from a very young age, you knew who you were. Um, but after some struggles through university, you started a successful healthcare research management company. Um, you chose not to include any images of yourself on the website or ads. How come? So working in healthcare research and especially in brain or neurological research, I knew that a lot of those individuals were male and they were white male. And I didn't want to contend with them seeing a picture of me as a young black female uh, about to manage this multi-million dollar project. I wanted the service that I was offering to speak for itself and then have to deal with maybe they don't want to work with me. But by the time I showed up, the contracts were already executed and then we could just start working without the distractive, distraction of my race or my gender being, play, or being an issue or playing an issue in getting the contract. Did you have any situation where you did meet them and there was uh, a reaction to you? Yeah, that happened a couple of different times where I'd walk into a meeting for the first time with a client. And of course, they're not expecting, they're expecting Resolve Research Solutions to be run by whoever they're thinking in their head. I walk into the room, I'm usually well-dressed, um, put together, and I go in to say hello. And clients would often, you know, kind of shoo me away and say, you know, I, you know wait your turn. And I just sit back and wait, and eventually they'll come to recognize that it's the person that's sitting there is the actual person that they're supposed to meet with, and it'll be wide-eyed, like, oh my goodness, I wasn't kind of expecting you. <laughs> and then at some point you decide, well, when Stephen Harper's finance minister, Jim uh, Flaherty, died suddenly in 2014, you decided yes. to run for his Whitby, Ontario seat in a by-election. You write that you weren't familiar with politics and that your daughter was actually helping you uh, understand civics. Um, why did you decide to run as a Liberal? So I had always voted liberal. Of course, we know with many Caribbean families uh, coming to Canada under the previous Trudeau meant that we were sort of aligned or had some allegiance to the Trudeau government. And so from very early, we had always voted liberal. I continued voting liberal. And I thought that it would be the best platform for me to run under based on some of the initiatives that they wanted to put forward that they had in their platform, but also things that I knew they had done in the past that 
really aligned with my values and my belief of government helping in terms of the social safety net that it provides. And so running as a liberal was the best thing that I thought suited me. Do you, um, <laughs> I, I know this isn't in the book, but I just wanted to follow up because in politics, there's this assumption that people, like black people vote a certain way, they vote for liberals. Um, and sometimes mm -hmm. I wonder if there's an opportunity where conservatives are um, not paying attention to the black community or where liberals will take advantage of the black community because that vote is guaranteed. I think on both on both fronts that is the case and I think that you know we saw Leslie Lewis of course run for the leadership of the conservative party and do and fare very well so I think there is this sort of groundswell of change around the impression or around the sort of belief that black communities across Canada will firmly align with the liberal party I think if the liberals aren't paying attention and the conservatives aren't using this opportunity that they're going to be facing a problem. And then, of course, we have Anna Mae Paul, who's, mm -hmm. you know, the leader of the Green Party. So there's going to be some challenges for the Liberals in the future. Well, in the, you decided to run again in 2015 after you lost the by-election. Um, and when you arrived at, and you won, and when you arrived <laughs> at Parliament Hill, you say that you were met with the, what you say, the frozen glares of white men who were disgruntled to see you. Why did you feel that way? So I don't know, like when you walk through the halls of Parliament Hill, you see many posters or sorry, pictures of individuals, of course, white men who have been leaders in the country. There's very little that depicts blackness and black communities and the contributions of black communities. In fact, many communities of color to Canada within the walls of parliament. So when you're walking through these spaces and remember Nam, these spaces were designed on exclusionary principles. They were never designed for women to be there, for women of color, for black women. So when you're seeing all these pictures of white men glaring at you, it kind of makes you question and wonder, is the space really as inclusive as it could be? Um, during your first meeting with uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, you were his former uh, parliamentary secretary. Um, this is after he made you the parliamentary secretary. He asked you if you trusted his judgment. What did you tell him? No. <laughs> what was his, what was his reaction? <laughs> well, you know, I, I noticed the tension sort of go up in the room. And you have to understand that, you know, as parliamentary secretary, I'm thinking this person wants me to be honest. And I've been married, at that time I was married to my husband for, for over 15 years. There are some times that I don't trust his judgment. And the fact that the prime minister is asking me this question, and I'd only known him for a very short period of time, I want him to know that I'm going to challenge him sometimes. I'm going to challenge his views, uh, his policy, his perspectives, um, because I, I don't necessarily trust his, his judgment. I don't know him. What was his reaction to you when you said, uh, I think what you said was no? I was like, nah. Mm -hmm. Like, really? <laughs> um, so the, the tension in the room, I felt that tension in the room kind of rise a little bit. And, and the, the subsequent question was, you know, why not? And I had heard from other individuals, uh, liberals or other people in, in media and other and other wise talking about how the ministers who were put in cabinet had helped him on his leadership campaign or helped during the election and i said well you know because of that reason that's why i don't trust your judgment it's it's too transparent you should have been a little bit more uh clear about who you were putting in cabinet and not so transparent around you know putting the people that helped you like it, it looks like nepotism and i don't really think that they appreciated that sort of straight talk, mm -hmm. these are the facts kind of person. Um, you would send emails to the prime minister's office. How often were your emails responded to? That, uh, maybe once or twice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it, was, it was interesting because as parliamentary secretary to the prime minister, I really wanted to ensure that I was supplementing any of the work that I was doing to his agenda to make sure that I was filling in the gaps, that I was not just sort of being like this figurehead of a person, but actually working to help re remove you some of token, this You say token, right? Work. You felt like a token? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And and these are one of the things that I said right from the beginning. So before he asked me that question about touching, trusting his judgment, I walked in and I said, I do not want to be 
I, I hope that I wasn't chosen for your for your as your parliamentary secretary to fill any racial or gender gaps that you have in your cabinet. I'm perfectly happy being the member of parliament for Whitby. Mm -hmm. And I was very clear that I didn't want to be tokenized. I, I'm highly educated. I ran a successful business. I could be strategic and I could help fill gaps in the work that he's doing. And that's what I expected the role to do. It turned out that it was not that role at all. Um, you even sent an email saying you're resigning, but I'll let people read the book to find out what happened. Um, I think event, it's, it felt like you were getting frustrated, even sometimes maybe angry with the lack of communication um, and that the PM wasn't delegating work to you or having you attend events on his behalf. But some could say that you know a risk adverse PMO might not trust an MP to represent them who flat out said uh, she didn't trust the uh, prime minister's judgment. What do you say to them? Well, I say to them that, what, like, what would you expect someone to say? Would you want them to just be the person that says yes to every single thing that you put forward? Or do you want somebody to challenge you? Again, this is not, you know, the local barista, the barista at our local coffee shop. I mean, all respect due to baristas. This is the, the leader of a G7 country who, in my opinion, you would want someone who's going to challenge you. You'd want someone who's not going to say yes to you all the time. You'd want someone who's going to provide that dissent and that strategy and that that difference of opinion but when if that conversation did happen where it was you know if they don't trust my if she doesn't trust my judgment we don't want her then I think some of that fallout we saw with the government towards the end especially around SNC and some of the other scandals that have come to fruition um, and at some point you decide that you're not going to run in the next election and when you told the uh, prime minister's office that you weren't going to run in the next election you got an immediate phone call from the prime minister Justin Trudeau here's how you describe it in the book I said I hope you can appreciate not today or tomorrow or a year from now the impact that the past year has had on my family with those words the prime minister lost it Oh my God, Selena, oh my God, I can't believe that you're telling me to understand. He insisted I should appreciate him for supporting me in the by-election. He pretty much yelled that he was tired of people reminding him of his privilege and ranted on about how he and his family had also been affected. When he was done speaking, I made him understand that I was not a child he could correct. What word did you use to make him understand that you were not a child that he could correct? I think this is a family show, Nam, so I'm not sure that I will repeat exactly what I said to him. But the tone that he spoke to me in, I made sure that it was responded to in kind. And I added a little bit more colorfulness to my language um, because I wanted him to know not only not, o not only that I wasn't that I wasn't a child, but I also represented 130,000 people in the town of Whitby. And how dare he speak to me as a representative of those people in that manner? And I was not going to let him get away with it. Um, I, 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 it's interesting because I don't know how many situations where you have a black woman uh, interviewing uh, another black person in this situation, because I understand what it's like to be uh, one and the only in a room um, and the stereotypes that come with being a black individual. Uh, in the book, you wrote about worrying about being defined as an angry black woman. Um, when you were in those kind of situations, did you find that anger was a useful or was it a detrimental emotion for you? So this is what I speak about in the book. You know, I speak about us bringing of all our flaws, our mistakes, our guilt, our shame, our hurts to bear and adding them and augmenting them with our strengths, our joys, our pleasures, our everything that makes us who we are, are built into all of those different facets. And while I try to hide sort of that that image where I would push against the status quo, I would try to articulate my conversations in such a way that I would want things to happen. I was afraid that I'd be labeled, but at some point you just gotta let it go. You just gotta be who you are because that is the only way that systems and policies and organizations could change. It can't change if we keep trying to fit into a mold. At some point we just have to be who we are. And if we're labeled, so be it. Um, I, there's a line in the book where you say that um, you were aware that as a black woman you had to be honest because if you weren't yes. honest it could come back to bite you. Was that part Absolutely. of it? Absolutely. 
Well, absolutely. I mean, I don't I don't think that we have a choice, though. You I, remember, I signed up to uh, to a government that said they were doing government differently, that they were going to be open and transparent, that diversity was their strength, that feminism was their core. And I showed up buying that product. I showed up understanding that if I didn't put an intersectional feminist lens, which I value in terms of everything that we did in terms of policy, we wouldn't get to a point where we're being equitable. We wouldn't achieve the goals that we wanted to achieve as a government. We came in again with 180 plus individuals, a majority government. There were things that we could have done that we didn't end up doing. <laughs> and I, I had no choice but to really push against that status quo. And I think at the end it cost me, but would I do it again the same way? Absolutely. What did it cost you? Well, it, it really cost, I think, first with leaving my job as parliamentary secretary for international development. It cost me that, a job that I truly loved. Um, it cost me, you know, being a part of a, 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 a liberal party, a party system that I really value. Like there's still some tenets of the liberal party that I that I value, that I think that serves our society, serves our communities. But I had to leave that because of the internal sort of friction that existed within that party system and then ultimately leaving politics. I enjoyed being the member of parliament for Whitby. I enjoyed the work that I was able to do on behalf of my constituents. But inside of that infrastructure, I knew that there wasn't something that fit well with who I was, the values that I bring forward and the principles that I stand by. Uh, and in the book, you do write about some of um, um, additional struggles you had um, as one of the few black people there. And you've been accused of seeing racism everywhere. I think uh, you've received a lot of tweets about that. What's your response to that criticism? Well, I think the response came two years later in 2020 where we're dealing with global focus on racial inequality. Right now, everybody seems to be woke, but it seems like, and I know that, black people have been awake for a very long time. And so the things that I was talking about in 2018 around race and racism and looking at uh, systemic racism that exists in our democratic institutions, the, the hub of our democracy in, in this country, and how it spreads to different parts of our systems, um, that conversation has come home to roost, so to speak, in 2020, where now we're forced to have these conversations about it. Community is very important to you, and you write about this in the book. Um, and did you see your main job as representing the people of Whippy? who actually elected you, um, and they're a majority white suburban Ontario riding, or representing the needs of black Canadians across Canada? I think that my, my main focus was on people with multiple intersecting identities who I know need government supports the most. We are now in a pandemic in 2020 where a highlight is clearly being shone on the disparities that exist with racialized people, with women, with people with disabilities. And those are the individuals that at the, at the heart of everything I did was at the center of that. And those are the individuals that are gonna be further marginalized by not just racial inequality or sexism or homophobia or ageism, but our pandemic and climate change and the refugee crisis and all of these other political, social and economic shocks to our system, those are the individuals that need us the most and those are the ones that we should be fighting for the most. Um, I wanted to, if it could be both, because in the book you write about the people that you did represent in Whitby um, and some of them being worried about, you know, what about my white sons? And I wonder if the same would have been asked if somebody, if, if it was a white individual, a white man, um, maybe advocating for the same things that you were advocating for. Why couldn't it have been both? Is it something that maybe I, I, you just weren't able to do because of what you look like? Well, th that's I don't, I don't think that that is necessarily true. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, that, that comment didn't come from anyone in Whitby. I just want to be clear mm -hmm. on that. That came from somebody else. But, you know, whether I was advocating for changes to the small business tax credit, challenging Bill Morneau on some of, of, of that, which impacted a lot of residents of Whitby, small business owners, I was able to do both. 
The highlight, though, the things that people focused on was when I spoke about racism, mm -hmm. when I spoke about intersectionality, when I spoke about equity. That's what sent, te tended to get people really riled up. But was I still challenging our government on policies that were disproportionately negatively impacting people in, a, in my community? Absolutely. You know, sending messages to Bill Morneau around the small business tax credit that had physicians in my riding uh, being negatively impacted small businesses. You, you better believe I did. So I, I could have done both. It was just that media and I guess in, in terms of social media, that was highlighted the most. Um, after you chose to leave the Liberals, you became an independent. You said staying yeah. them would have meant subordinating your values. Uh, but can you appreciate that for a party politics to work, uh, politicians uh, have to kind of put their own uh, individual they have to allow their individual emotions to take a back seat, that a party has to be united in order to affect change. Absolutely. I could totally get on board with that. However, um, I think that there are some times where at no point can you get rid of or put your principles on that back seat. Uh, you know, I quote Clayton Christensen in my book and talk about his essay on how will you measure your life. And he indicates that, you know, it's easier to stand by your principles 100 percent of the time than it is to stand by your principles 98 percent of the time. And I know to the people that I that elected me that I promised that I would be authentic, that I would challenge, that I would do government done differently. The people that lived in Whitby, the people that I knocked on doors and had great conversations with. I know that they would appreciate that kind of pushback, that kind of standing in the integrity of yourself and integrity that I think many people in this community have. And I was not going to put that to the side in order to have a party that claims to want to do politics differently, claims to want to be diverse and feminist and uh, open and transparent and I think many times we have seen that they have not. Um, you, in the book, you, uh, I mentioned at the beginning, uh, you said that you like to swear. And during this pandemic, <laughs> I've discovered my love of that. Um, but in the book, you also write about how you're a crier. Um, and reading this book uh, and the experiences that you went through in um, kind of like a concentrated period of time, what was it like for you um, emotionally, personally, even with your family? Because when you were um, in office, you did receive a lot of hate mail um, against your family as well, death threats. Uh, what was it like for you to go through this process of, I guess, reliving those moments and writing about them? You know, this was a very cathartic process. Um, my editor at Penguin Random House Canada, her name's Ann Collins, she lives in Whitby as well. And she said to me, you know, at one point when I was writing, she said, Selena, do you want this book to hurt or to heal? And it was really important for me to make sure that this book was a healing, had a lot of healing in it. Um, I cried a lot when I wrote it, you know, either talking about my early parts of my life, my marriage, my running my business, my children, or politics. I cried a lot, you know, sort of digging deep and getting out all those parts of you that you think you bury away or you think you're not bothered by and putting them on the page is a very cathartic process. But then when you work with someone like Anne, who's able to say, okay, now let's shape all that hurt and guilt and shame and mistakes into a healing process into a, into words that heal that's i think what the outcome of this book is and why i think so many it's resonating with so many people and they could see themselves in it because it's not just about her it's about healing it's a great book congratulations and i think it's also um kind of like a uh, about leadership how to move in this world and your husband and your family uh you know just the foundation you have is incredible congratulations and a terrific read selena thank you for being with us tonight Thank you so much, Nam. I appreciate it. Really Thank appreciate you so much. It. Be well and stay safe. You too. They are as old as the hills and the source of work, play, and most critically, perhaps, drinking water to millions. The Great Lakes span an international border and several other jurisdictional boundaries. As such, there is an inevitable juggling act as governing bodies in those places come and go.
Now, with a very different president in power in the U.S., we thought it a good time to check in on this vital corridor that joins our two nations. And for that, let's welcome, in Chicago, Illinois, Molly Flanagan. She's the COO at the Alliance for the Great Lakes. That's a nonpartisan, nonprofit environmental organization. In Cornwall, Ontario, Henry Lickers, biologist and Canadian commissioner at the IJC. That's the International Joint Commission that oversees water issues along the Canada-U.S. border. He's also a Haudenosaunee citizen of the Seneca Nation. And in Windsor, Ontario, Michael McKay, executive director and professor at the Great Lakes Institute for Environmental Research at the University of Windsor. And it's a great pleasure to have you three with us tonight here on TVO. I thought I'd just start our discussion here by putting a few facts on the record, which you three surely know, uh, but which our viewers and listeners may not, but they will now once we do this. So, Sheldon, if you would, the graphic, please. The Great Lakes, imagine this, hold 20% of all the fresh water on Earth. One in four Canadians draw their drinking water directly from those lakes. Their combined surfaces are about the size of the United Kingdom. More than 40 million people live in the Great Lakes Basin, and if measured as a country, the region represents the third largest economy in the world, supporting 51 million jobs. That is 30% of the combined Canadian and American workforce. Are the Great Lakes important? You bet they are. However, Molly, let's use this metaphor. If they were a patient, what diagnosis would you give them right now? I'd say the Great Lakes are in serious condition which might come as a surprise to a number of people because if you stand on the shores of the Great Lakes, they mostly look okay, but there are a number of problems looming. Serious condition is better than critical condition, which is what I thought you might be saying. Not in critical condition? You know, we're at a critical juncture where we can either tackle these big problems and improve the health of the Great Lakes, or we risk them slipping into critical condition, or worse. Understood. Let's show a bit of what you might be referring to here. And to that end, I'm going to ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, to bring a, a couple of pictures back to back. And for those listening on podcast, I'll just describe them a little bit. We're talking ice cover here. These photos were taken by NASA. And the first picture here is February 2014, so about seven years ago. 80% of the lakes are covered in ice, and that actually set a 20-year record. And, you know, for those who can't see it and can only hear about it, basically we're looking at the Great Lakes all white, except for some of Lake Michigan and some of Lake Ontario, but basically it's covered. Let's dissolve to the next picture. Here is last February, where only 17% of the lakes are covered in ice. That is a near record low. The average amount of ice cover at this time of year is usually 40%, instead 17%. And in the dead of winter, there is lots of blue there. A lot of ice did, did not happen. And Mike, maybe you could pick up the story. What does the decline in ice cover mean for the Great Lakes? Uh, many implications uh, of reduced ice cover, Steve. Uh, we've been seeing about a 70, 75% decline in, in ice cover uh, of the Great Lakes over the past uh, four to five decades, much uh, like we see in the Arctic. Uh, loss of ice in the lakes has many implications, as I mentioned, uh, increased coastal erosion. Um, we have uh, uh, certainly effects on, on the ecosystem uh, in the Great Lakes. And also, I think we should look at ice as a major uh, uh, important cultural identifier uh, in the Great Lakes region. Meaning what? Uh, meaning that, that many people living in the Great Lakes region uh, take to the lakes even during winter uh, uh, for winter recreation, ice fishing, for example. Uh, loss of ice also parallels, I think, the loss of, uh, you know, the, 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 the more mild temperatures we're seeing in the region, uh, loss of, of skating rinks in, in backyards. Uh, so many things that we traditionally identify with winter activities are at risk. Understood. All right, let's do one more of these metrics, and then we'll get Henry in after this. Let's, uh, Sheldon, bring up the picture of the algae blooms. Now, this is about a year and a half ago in Lake Erie, and, you know, while some people might think, wow, that's a beautiful green, I'm pretty sure the Great Lakes are not supposed to be that color of green. These algae blooms, Molly, they are now showing up every summer. What kind of damage can they do? Yeah, this is a significant problem. The Great Lakes definitely shouldn't look like pea soup. Um, harmful algal blooms and dead zones are cropping up, as you said, across the Great Lakes each summer, and they're largely caused by unregulated agricultural pollution. Um, and the harmful algal blooms in Lake Erie have actually been so bad in the past that the city of Toledo lost its water supply 
uh, for two days in 2015 because there was a toxin in the harmful algal bloom called cyanobacteria that actually poisoned the drinking water and made it unsafe to drink. And Michael, is this situation getting better or worse? Uh, it, it really varies. Uh, 2019, as, as Molly uh, uh, mentioned, uh, was, was quite a bad year in terms of, of uh, the, the harmful algal bloom. Uh, this past summer, uh, the bloom was relatively modest in size, and a lot of it has to do with, with the amount of precipitation we get uh, during the spring, uh, which relates to the amount of, of runoff and nutrients that, that sort of primes the bloom uh, heading into the summer. Uh, so, so, as was alluded, uh, a lot of the issues related to harmful algal blooms relate to what's going on in the watershed. Uh, dealing with watershed issues is, 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 is uh, uh, important for ensuring uh, that the lakes uh, are dealt with as well. All right, with this background now in place, let's get Henry Lickers into this conversation because your First Nation sits right on the Canada-U.S. border near the St. Lawrence River. And I wonder, Henry, if you would just share uh, some of what your experience is with the waterways of your community and the differences that you have noticed over the last many years. Well, we have a very long record of living in this area. Our uh, archaeological evidence goes back to 9,000 years ago. Uh, some of the grand grandparents call it when the ice left, that's when we arrived. Uh, but we've known this river and uh, the Great Lakes for all this period of time, and we've seen drastic changes in it as it's occurred. In the last couple hundred years, though, we've seen as people have moved into the Great Lakes and begin to utilize the resources there, we began to see shifts in all of the populations. Uh, so, for example, salmon, those type of things that used to run the river no longer do that because of the dams and the uh, hydroelectric works that we have. Uh, at one point early in the in the our living here, and when the first contact the settlers first arrived, uh, they would use sturgeon as firewood because there were so many of them they could just throw them up on the shore and they dry out. They had lots of oil in them, and you could throw them straight into a a boiler and burn it in order to make steam for your your uh, ships. Eels were in the trillions. And today, when you look at these great fish in, in the St. Lawrence, you don't see anywhere near that. And so there's been many, many different changes of that type. And the Mohawk people, and the Haudenosaunee people, Anishinaabe people in the area have been worried about the St. Lawrence and about the Great Lakes in general for uh, you know, hundreds of years. Henry, you mentioned that when the dams were created, that changed a lot of things about your traditional way of life. Uh, what about uh, other reasons as well? Pollution or the way that tourism is used in the area? What contribution have well, they made? Well, the, uh, the, uh, of course, the St. Lawrence Seaway and the Great Lakes were looked on as a great resource. And so they uh, utilized it, built industries by it, used the power uh, in order to uh, produce aluminum and other metals and things like this. And at that time, you know, the solution to pollution was dilution. You just threw everything into the river, and of course it would all go down the river to the sea. Well, when they did that, uh, they contaminated the fish so much so that our people couldn't eat them the way we did. And remember that the Haudenosaunee people, like 75% of our protein source came out of the St. Lawrence River in the form of fish. And so we no longer had that, and uh, we had to change our diets. And when we did that, we changed them to high carbohydrate diets, which now leads to something like 75% of the people at Aquazusne having abnormal, abnormal glucose tolerance or diabetes. I myself have diabetes as well. So massive changes to the ecosystem, but also changes to the society. Uh, fishing was a mainstay. Uh, everybody knew how to fish. Nowadays, we have to teach our young how to fish, but they can't eat the fish in many cases. Hmm. So this changes the culture, changes the way that you look at the river. Uh, we still love it, and it's still a gorgeous river, but you're always afraid. Molly, what about invasive species? What's happening on that front? Invasive species continue to be a significant problem for the Great Lakes. They've changed the entire ecosystem of the Great Lakes. And it's not just the invasive species that are already there that we have concerns about. 
It's the possibility of new aquatic invasive species being introduced by ships that come uh, from other places in the world or swimming up rivers uh, like the Illinois River into the Chicago area waterway system and using that as a superhighway uh, to get into Lake Michigan. So aquatic invasive species continue to be a significant issue for the Great Lakes and one of the reasons I say they're, they're in serious condition. We just saw a picture of somebody with a fistful of zebra mussels. What do they do to the Great Lakes? So zebra mussels filter out um, a lot of the, the bottom of the food web. And so they leave the lakes essentially devoid of food that smaller fish use to eat and grow. And what that does is then deprive bigger fish of those smaller fish. And so that's one of the ways in which we've seen the collapse of the food web in Lake Michigan and in other places around the Great Lakes. Michael, let's talk climate change. What impact is climate change having on the Great Lakes and how would we notice it? Well, we've uh, looked at one of the impacts already, and that's the declining ice coverage uh, over the lakes. Uh, certainly climate change is a part of, of that issue. Uh, the other thing we're seeing with climate change is uh, increased warming of surface waters. Uh, so places like Lake Superior, uh, we're seeing, you know, two degrees Celsius uh, average warming over the past uh, decade or two. Uh, this warming, this increased warming can actually have uh, implications then for uh, uh, cyanobacterial blooms, for example. Uh, we see the, this, the water stratifying earlier in the season. In other words, the, the, the top layer warming preferentially over bottom layers. Uh, that allows, allows for, for more heating in that, in that top layer. And uh, things like the cyanobacteria that cause these harmful algal blooms like warmer water. And Molly, let's just look at the last four years. How much of a priority was all the things that we've talked about so far, finding improvements to them, improving the health of the Great Lakes? How much of all of that was part of the Trump administration's priority list? It was clearly not a priority for the Trump administration. I would say the Trump administration really took the United States backward in terms of protecting the environment and public health. And there is a lot of damage to be undone over the next four years. And Henry, I should get your view on that as well, because you, of course, work with the IJC, the International Joint Commission, which is a Canada-U.S. international organization. You would have had to deal with Trump appointees on that organization, presumably. Uh, what was your experience? Well, when uh, Trump uh, came in, of course, we, I was worried. I was worried about the people who would be put on the, the commission with me, since the commissioners served for the the transboundary waters. That's what we work for, is to protect them and to take care of them. And uh, we were worried that, I was worried anyways, that uh, this may not be the way that they thought of it. However, when they came on board and we sat down and we started to talk about the Great Lakes, talked about two of the people were from Michigan, someone was from uh, Man Montana, New York State. They, I suddenly found people who were very worried about the Great Lakes and how they were functioning. And uh, as we put all of our skill sets together, their skill sets and my our skill sets from Canada, um, suddenly we had a cohesive team that could look at a lot of these problems. And we began first to search out people within the Great Lakes to find out what they thought the issues were. Well, that's interesting. Mike, let me follow up with you on that because to the best of my knowledge, when we did a program about this, uh, I guess a year or two ago, uh, there was something called the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative that the Trump administration, I believe, wanted to cut their budget something like 90 percent. Never ended up happening. Do you know why? It's because of the tremendous bipartisan support uh, within the region. Uh, so I spent most of my career working in the U.S., uh, living in a Republican district. Uh, so even, uh, even living in areas like that where there's uh, tremendous support for Republican policies, individuals rally around the Great Lakes. More than 85% of, uh, of the citizens living within the Great Lakes region uh, would like to see uh, more funding uh, to ensure the integrity and health of our, of our Great Lakes. I think what I see is, is, is people make connections with the lakes, regardless of your political affiliation. Uh, they realize how important the lakes are to, to our livelihood, uh, to our economy. And these are things that span uh, uh, political parties. Well, we're at the beginning now, Molly, of a new administration, and, you know, there's always a certain amount of optimism early on in a new administration. 
until reality sets in. So let me find out how optimistic you are that the Biden administration is going to be different for the Great Lakes than the previous one was. Well, Steve, we've already seen a significant change in tone regarding environmental protection and environmental justice. Um, President Biden clearly takes climate change seriously, uh, is already taking actions to address it with a focus not just on environmental protection, but also on jobs and the economy. Um, you know, he's already signed a number of executive orders that are focused on the environment and climate change. And so at this point, we feel really optimistic about the Biden administration. And we'd really like to see him focus um, on water infrastructure. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about an infrastructure package here in the United States. And we think it's critical that Great Lakes residents be provided with safe and affordable drinking water that can also put people to work. Um, this gets to a point that I think Henry made earlier is that we really can't divorce the health of the Great Lakes from the health of the people who live around them. Yeah, Michael, you're just across the border, well, a little ways from Flint, Michigan, but uh, certainly a lot closer than the rest of us are. Uh, are they drinking the, uh, can they drink the water in Flint yet? I mean, when you talk about water infrastructure, it seemed to me that they ought to be near the top of the list. Uh yeah, no, these are these are serious concerns, uh, and there needs to be major infrastructure uh, 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 funding uh, put in place uh, for places like Flint, but also drinking water intakes uh, around the basin are, are aging uh, and and need attention now. Uh, so, you know, in in, in terms of Flint, uh, you know, they are making uh, changes to infrastructure, but it's unfortunate that an incident like that uh, needs to take place to to put people into action. Henry, what are your hopes and expectations now that a new administration is in place? Well, I'm uh, hopeful that the uh, Biden administration will look upon favorably upon the Great Lakes. And uh, I know that I've now been reading some of the executive orders that have come out. And there's one there on indigenous people that I think is quite, quite useful to the Great Lakes as well. Uh, but there's also one on climate change and others that and the environment. And I see this as hopeful signs that uh, we'll be able to do a lot more work in the in the Great Lakes. I think it should be mentioned, though, that uh, as the other speakers have been talking about, we talk as if the federal funds that we put into saving the Great Lakes area are a great amount, and they may be large. However, for every dollar, a federal dollar that's put in, I wouldn't be a bit surprised that you could double, triple or multiply it times five times by the amount of work put in by normal people in the Great Lakes to protect the lands around them. So there's a lot of people here who are, are supporting the Great Lakes and really want it to be cleaned up and, and, and healthy again. Let's talk pipeline problems. And uh, to that effect, I'm going to ask our director again to bring up a shot of the map. Here we go. This is Enbridge Line 5, and again, for those listening on podcast, I'll describe it a bit because it starts at Superior in Wisconsin, and this is, you know, this is half a million barrels of oil and natural gas every day going along that yellow line from Superior, Wisconsin, underneath a small part of the Great Lakes uh, to Cernia, and Michigan officials have told Enbridge to close the old pipeline by the 12th of May. They say it's too environmentally risky. Canadian officials conversely say that would choke off more than half of what we need to make gasoline and jet fuel, and it would mean thousands of lost jobs. Uh, okay, Molly, resolve this dispute for us in the next minute. Uh, who's right on this, the governor of Michigan or the Canadian officials? I wish I could resolve this in, in less than a minute. Um, what I would say is that the, the pipeline under the Straits of Mackinac Line 5 does pose an unnecessary risk to Steve, as you noted at the top of the hour, that the 20% of the Earth's fresh surface water. And Michigan's Governor Granholm has announced that she's revoking and terminating Enbridge's easement. Um, Enbridge, of course, is challenging that in court. So I think the fate of Line 5 is likely to be settled in the courts. I just wanted to uh, check. Did you say Governor Michigan, uh, Governor, Michigan Governor Granholm? Yes, Michigan's, oh, sorry, <laughs> Michigan's Governor Whitmer. That's Whitmer, going yes. Going back many years, Michigan's Governor Whitmer announced in November that she was revoking and terminating Enbridge's lease. Right on. Uh, easement. Jennifer Granholm, I think she's Canadian. Well, she's not Canadian, but she's born in she, Canada, which may be why she was top of mind for you. Yes, and also joining the, the Biden administration. Yes, she is, indeed. Okay, Mike, this standoff, how do you view it? Uh, this is an issue that needs to be addressed, uh, obviously. Uh, 
as uh, as, as Molly mentioned, uh, you know, it, it is is an environmental uh, uh, concern uh, uh, if that if that pipeline is breached, such as one of the other Enbridge pipelines was at, at Kalamazoo uh, into the Kalamazoo River several years ago. Uh, in a, a major environmental disaster uh, awaits needs to be addressed but on the other side we do have uh, a lot of jobs in places like sarnia uh, that that rely on that and we don't have mechanisms in place r right now to deal with the deficit uh, you know heating oil uh, uh, gasoline that's that, that's coming from that propane and it's not just not just southwestern Ontario or, or Canada uh, but it's also Michigan and and the state of Ohio as well uh, so we need to address this uh, hopefully again with the new initiatives uh, planned by the Biden administration uh, tackling climate change uh, will continue to help wean us off of fossil fuels um, but this has been going on since the 1950s, and uh, we need to, need to ensure, at least for now, uh, that delivery of, of uh, fossil fuels, uh, oil and gas, to this area is done safely. Well, Molly, let me ask the obvious follow-up, which is, if you don't like it happening under the Great Lakes through these pipelines, the alternative is shipping, trains, trucks. Surely that's not better for climate change and, and perhaps could be even more dangerous. Yeah, and that, that's what makes this a really complicated issue, is that moving oil from pipelines onto ships or trains obviously is not a safer alternative for communities that live around the Great Lakes um, or potentially for drinking water. We definitely don't think that, that crude oil should be moving on vessels on the Great Lakes. And so uh, that is a really, a really challenging issue and one that we need to be cognizant of. Any, anywhere we shut down oil movement, we're potentially moving that oil elsewhere. And, you know, I think ideally we'll be moving away from oil uh, as we're working to tackle climate change. Well, if you think that's a tricky issue, we're going to talk about one that's even more complicated right now, and that's nuclear waste. Because Canada's Nuclear Waste Management Organization has been tasked with finding a permanent home for the, get this, three million spent nuclear fuel bundles. And one place that they've been considering for several years now is an area in the South Bruce near the shore of Lake Huron. They would like to build a big state-of-the-art underground vault there for all the spent nuclear fuel bundles. Um, right now, all the material is just sitting above the ground at the nuclear power station. Uh, okay, Mike, get us started on this. Uh, what's the solution here? Well, we, we, we need a long-term solution. Uh, the U.S. has been grappling with this for, for decades now. Uh, in the late 1980s, they identified a location in Nevada, uh, Yucca Mountain, as being a geologically stable location where they could bury uh, spent nuclear waste uh, from, from nuclear uh, power facilities across the country. That was 1987. Uh, throughout the late 1990s in the Bush administration, they tried to revive uh, the initiative. And we kept hearing uh, the same thing, uh, not in my backyard. Now, now, not that the location in Nevada was directly in someone's backyard, uh, but moving that spent nuclear fuel from the power uh, stations across country by rail uh, was passing through the backyards of people. And uh, again, lots of, lots of, of community lobbying uh, that went on that have continued to stall that initiative uh, even through now. Uh, so we're looking at these, these, uh, uh, this situation in Canada. And again, we need to have a stable situation, a stable uh, uh, repository because we, we have, the, the, the matter of the fact is we have this spent fuel waste. And my concern about the way it's been handled until now is, is the security. Uh, these uh, the spent uh, fuel rods are, are are stored either in in wet storage in pools or or dry storage after after the seven, seven to ten years spent in a, in a in a pool, and they could be the targets of, of terrorism. That's a, a big concern. And so identifying a location uh, a thousand meters underground in a geologically stable location is a priority. I think is a priority. But how how about right beside Lake Huron? Are you okay with that location? I, 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 again, I think if we can if we can uh, uh, identify a place that that has the least potential uh, disruption to the environment, there's not going to be a single place that 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 fits all those criteria. Uh, but but again, when we're looking at uh, uh, a resource such as the Great Lakes uh, that provide drinking water to tens of millions of people, uh, that should certainly weigh into the consideration of of, of where this is located. Henry, what's your view on the advisability of putting that nuclear waste storage facility on the shores of, I shouldn't say on the shores of, uh, on the Bruce Peninsula near Lake Huron? 
Well, for my, myself, I'd worry about the location. From the IJC's point of view, again, we uh, are looking at all of these issues, whether they be pipelines or um, nuclear waste disposals, we're looking at them. And uh, what we can do is, however, if we have concerns and people raise those concerns with the IJC, we can take those to the parties um, and look to them under our mandate uh, we are supposed to alert uh, the countries when there may be disputes, there may be problems. Uh, that was the reason in 1909 that the Boundary Waters Treaty was signed so that the two countries could discuss these things and use that platform in order to explore solutions for them. The St. Mary's Milk, many of the rivers out west, you know, were in dispute between Canada and the United States to the effect that as they say, we almost were getting ready to go to war. You know, uh, those type of things were really important. Well, we're seeing the same thing today with other, other issues. And so the IJC has a mandate to raise to the parties any issues that we think may disrupt uh, the good flow of information and solutions between Canada and the United States. However, in order to investigate those, we need references from the parties in order to be able to do that. So on one hand, yep, I, I would be concerned as an individual, but as the IJC, we look to our, uh, our public and the people around, uh, if this is an issue that wishes to be looked at, then we can forward that to the parties. And we've already done that uh, with both of these issues in, uh, in the, the current the current commission. All right, Molly, I should get your view on the advisability of using that South Bruce location for nuclear waste storage. Storing nuclear waste next to the Great Lakes doesn't seem worth the risk to the 40 million people who depend on the Great Lakes for their drinking water. Period, full stop. Yeah. Well, okay, let me just for argument's sake put the other side on the record, which is the nuclear waste is being created at the Bruce nuclear facilities and therefore, Presumably, you want to store it close to that facility. Once you start talking about transporting it further away from the Great Lakes to a place that might make you more comfortable in terms of its relationship with the Great Lakes, you do have the potential of transportation problems and other safety concerns. What about that argument? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have a great alternative to propose. Uh, this is a really difficult issue. People feel really passionately about it. And as Mike pointed out, you know, in the United States, We've long looked at, at Yucca Mountain as a potential place to store nuclear waste, but you run into all kinds of issues, including the transportation issue, Steve, that you bring up, and the fact that places like Yucca Mountain are sacred lands for indigenous people here in the United States. So uh, this, is, this is a really challenging one. Uh, very challenging, but Mike, the reality is that the lights that are on in this studio and the electricity that you're using to talk to us right now I mean, half of that is created in the province of Ontario by nuclear power. We are overwhelmingly relying on nuclear power to keep, to keep us moving. So the question then becomes, if we don't put it there, this stuff's only going to get larger. Where, where are we going to put it? What are we going to do? Well, uh, the, the federal government is looking at, at various sites across the country. I believe one of the other sites that, that they're looking at right now uh, is uh, northwest of Thunder Bay. Uh, but again, uh, there will be concerns uh, amongst the, the, the communities uh, in that area as well. Uh, so again, this is something we need to address. Uh, right now, the, the spent waste is stored on site, whether it be at, at Kincardine around Bruce, uh, whether it be in, in the Oshawa area around Darlington or Pickering, uh, or whether it's in Quebec or New Brunswick. And to have a, a, a consolidated location uh, that, that is secure and again, geologically stable, uh, needs to be a priority. Yeah, Molly, some problems are so intractable, they don't have an apparent solution. Is this one of them? I mean, I think this one is definitely, as I mentioned, a challenge and one that uh, we've been trying to solve in the United States for years. It sounds like Canada has been wrestling with this one. I don't think that there are problems that lack solutions. Um, I think human ingenuity uh, and problem solving skills can take us a long way. So I'm hopeful that this is an issue that we can resolve. Uh, unfortunately, 
I perhaps am not uh, quite smart enough to, to figure out the solution for us. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go to Henry with this then. Henry, pick, in our remaining moments here, pick one problem related to the Great Lakes that you care deeply about and tell us how it could be solved. Oh, <laughs> Well, one of the problems that I see with the, the Great Lakes is uh, the whole uh, issue of contaminants. Uh, one of the things that we uh, see as a native people is, is that we, the scientists and the governments all stare at one contaminant at a time. And so they look, they say, say, oh, well, mercury, PCBs, dioxins, dibenzofurans, but they look only at one contaminant at a time. Uh, I'm afraid that the fish uh, don't take one contaminant at a time, they take them all. And so to us, it's how can we look at the impact of these contaminants on human beings? Uh, not just one, but all of them together. Uh, and this is an issue that I think uh, will become greater as we go along because the sciences are now having to deal with these type of questions in the environment. If we think the nuclear... Uh, Disposal is, is a tough question. Uh, think about how many contaminants we have in the environment. And really, we have very little understanding about how they all work together, hmm. whether they compound each other or whether they work individually or synergistically. We really don't know. And yet, we continue to put them into the environment. So I think that will become a question that is going to be... Uh, sort of high on the agenda as time goes on. Mike, one big problem that you'd love to see solved and how you'd solve it. Well, I'm a little biased here because a lot of the research that, that uh, I conduct uh, here at the Great Lakes Institute for Environmental Research relates to the harmful algal blooms in Western Lake Erie and Lake St. Clair. Uh, and this is an issue that I think we know how to solve it. It just requires, uh, requires will. Uh, this is an error, this is an issue that, that uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, takes into account actions in our watershed and uh, the resulting implications within the lake. Agricultural activity uh, far and away is is behind uh, the, the algal blooms we see in Western Lake Erie, uh, Lake St. Clair. And so trying to identify solutions uh, to, to mitigate these blooms, and we know they're going to be expensive. It's it's uh, we're looking at if, if if left unchecked. In a recent study by by scientists in Environment Canada, uh, showed that if left unchecked, we'd be looking at 270 million dollars per year, uh, in, in in costs incurred just in the Canadian portion of, of Lake Erie, uh, due to re losses in tourism, uh, treatment of, of of drinking water. Uh, ecosystem services, et cetera. So, so again, working with social science scientists to understand uh, uh, human behavior, uh, identifying incentives uh, that we can work with our, our agricultural community, uh, and, and continuing uh, progress in, in best management practices in agriculture uh, so that we can reduce the runoff of nutrients from the watershed into our lakes. Gotcha. That, that let, me, blows. let me save the last 30 seconds for Molly, a problem that you'd like to see solved and how you'd solve it. Well, we talked a bit about aquatic invasive species earlier and Asian carp are a fish that are getting a lot of attention in the United States and in Canada. Um, and recently the US Army Corps of Engineers and the state of Illinois and Michigan have all of the agreements and funding in place to move to the next phase of a project that's designed to keep Asian carp out of Lake Michigan and out of the Great Lakes. So they've designed an Asian carp gauntlet that includes a number of technologies. Um, and if we can get those technologies put into place, we hope that we can keep Asian carp out of the Great Lakes forever. My thanks to Molly Flanagan, Henry Lickers, and Michael McKay for spending so much time with us here on TVO tonight. Thanks so much, you three, and be safe out there. Thank, Thank you. you. And that is the agenda for Tuesday, February 2nd, 2021. As the shift to online video conferencing and Zoom for everything from work to weddings reveal differences in how men and women present themselves to the world. We'll find out tomorrow. Also, the Globe and Mail's Robin Doolittle joins us on her series investigating why women still face a considerable power gap in the Canadian workforce. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. Now, stay tuned for a new episode of Political Blind Date coming up now on TVO.